Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? Enjoying the social forum so far? <laughs> That's good. My name is uh, Noor Al Kadri. I'm uh, a professor of strategic management and governance at the University of Ottawa. I also teach artificial intelligence at the School of Engineering. I'm a former vice president of the Canadian Arab Federation and I've been following uh, what's going on in Syria since uh, the beginning of uh, what they call the revolution uh, with the Arab Spring that turned out to be a bloody Arab winter. And uh, so today we're going to be sharing with you some of the um, information that we know of, that, uh, some of the analysis that we could uh, look at. And of course, uh, my colleague here, Ken Stone, um, is uh, going to be uh, a witness to what is happening in Syria. Uh, Ken uh, has been uh, working with us, the Syria Solidarity Movement. He's a, he's a member of the, uh, of the committee there. He has been to, on a trip to, to Syria uh, lately with uh, it's the second tour with the International Peace, uh, International Tour of Peace to Syria, and that was in 2016. Uh, so he has a um, First, he's a first-hand witness to show you on what the, some of the things that uh, you see. First, Ken uh, has been um, working on uh, things of importance to all of us, probably everybody who attends the World Social Forum. Uh, he's a long-time anti-war activist, he's tre 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 treasurer of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. He's a former steam committee member of the Canadian Peace Alliance. He's an executive member of the Syria Solidarity Movement. He is a writer with globalresearch.ca and human data on uh, Press TV. He has a uh, roughly 45 to 50 minute presentation that he is going to go through uh, mainly um, on things that he has seen in, uh, in Syria as part of that uh, tour as, uh, as a witness. Uh, we suggest that uh, you um, ask questions once he's, he's done his presentation, and then I will be doing uh, follow up. I'm going to be uh, mainly talking about some facts in a, in a shorter piece that will uh, embrace the discussion and then we will have an interactive uh, an interactive discussion with uh, uh, with each other. Uh, any questions before we start? Could you just repeat your name? My name is Noor, N-O-U-R, El Capri. And uh, for someone like me who's worked in various places around the world, I've worked during the uh, what they call the Arab Spring in Egypt with the National Democratic Institute. I was having political parties in there, and I worked with 17 political parties. And I've commuted to Lebanon and Syria a lot. I've seen things firsthand uh, most of the time. Uh, my opinions are based on lots of research, based on lots of facts. And of course, uh, these analyses, I'd like to share with them. Of course, uh, I welcome any uh, respectful challenges and criticisms that will organize the debate, and these are part of, uh, of the discussion today. Then, the floor is yours. Thank you, Newer. Uh, I uh, would like to please come in. Uh, I uh, would like, first of all, to acknowledge the presence of a colleague from the peace movement, Martina El from the Echec à la Guerre, Montréal. As a member of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, I worked with members of uh, the Echec uh, à la Guerre in the Canadian Peace Alliance for many years. And so, uh, welcome, Martine. Martine has literature there that she uh, would like to distribute afterwards, too. So, uh, please uh, see Martine if you'd like to see what they produce here in Montreal. It's all very good stuff. Um, I am going to start actually with a big picture. Uh, before I actually get into what I saw and heard in Syria, I'm going to, oh, I think I'd like to sit here. Thank you very much. So, uh, the big picture. Uh, shortly after 9 11, General Wesley Clark reported for duty at the Pentagon. And when he got there, he was astonished to hear from an old comrade that uh, the United States was going to take out seven countries in five years. And this was the hit list that he was told. And you can see it there, I don't have to read it. And below I mention Afghanistan, there's two other uh, countries that were hit in the, in the last 15 years, and those were Haiti, Haiti, and Honduras. 
So all these countries were, uh, the, the top line of countries were on a hit list as far back as 2001. And you can see Syria is number two, told to General Wesley Clark in 2001. I mention this because in the West we are fed this uh, steady narrative of uh, how the war in Syria is a civil war. But in my opinion, it's not a civil war. This is a U.S. military intervention. Um, not much different from the interventions in all the other countries you can see there. And it's an illegal intervention, just as all the others were illegal interventions. And then not only that, because it's an illegal intervention, the people of Syria have the right to resist. And the government of Syria, under international law, has not only the right, but the obligation to use its forces to repel the invaders and to restore the national sovereignty and territorial integrity of Syria. Now, the reason that Wesley Clark reported to the Pentagon was because of this man's so-called war of terror that he announced after 9-11. And we know now that it was not a war on terror, but a war of terror. A war of terror against the people of the global south, and mainly of West Asia. Uh, and it, was, it had these characteristics. Okay, first of all, it's an endless war. Uh, it's a war that goes on and on and on, and it serves the interest of what General Eisen, President Eisenhower in his parting address in 1961 called the military-industrial complex. Uh, after the, the collapse of the Soviet <coughs> Union, there was no boogeyman anymore to create, to cause the, uh, to prevent or to, uh, to promote the, uh, to promote the uh, uh, endless um, military expenditures in the United States. And so they needed a new boogeyman, and they, they had, they created one in terrorism. So uh, that's the first characteristic. The second is Islamophobia and racial profiling. Uh, the racial profiling that uh, our sister here experiences uh, in the United States of uh, black people, the racial profiling that Muslims and Arabs face at airports and by police and in housing and in every other field of life, is a direct result of Bush's war on terror. Uh, which should be war of terror. Furthermore, there's a campaign of disinformation. Uh, disinformation uh, means, in plain English, lies. And when they started the, the war of terror back in 2001, the uh, neocons were very clear that they were going to also have a, a campaign of disinformation. They said so. So we should not be surprised when, they, when we find them telling lies all the time. And finally, uh, it's characterized by a complete lack of respect for international law. Uh, Bush said, we are going to go after the terrorists whenever and whenever we want. And that means without any respect to the national sovereignty of sovereign countries. And uh, no, not only would they be the cops of the world, but they would act like uh, barbarians. They would uh, have torture. They would have rendition. So they, these are the features of Bush's war of terror. And since 1989, when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, uh, we've had a unipolar world for 25 years. It ended, in my opinion, in uh, 2014 in Eastern Europe, when uh, Putin stood up to the Americans after the U.S. led U.S. coup in the Ukraine. And uh, we've seen that now in Syria, uh, the Russians and the uh, the Russians have had a major effect standing up to the Americans in Syria. So for 25 years, we had a unipolar world where the United States had a complete sway. There are seats up here. Um, and uh, during that period, they, they were trying to go for what they called US global hegemony, which in plain English means world domination. Um, and they were determined to prevent the rise of rival states. They cut away whole pieces of what used to be the Soviet Union. Uh, they cut them away from Russia, and they are now separate states. Uh, they put dozens of military bases all around their, their perceived enemies, such as Iran, China, Russia. Uh, they wanted to get control of the global energy resources. Uh, that doesn't mean that they, the United States needed 
the, all the oil and gas in the world. They're pretty well self-sufficient. But if they had the control of the, uh, the resources, the energy resources of the world, if they had their hands on the tap and they could determine who gets energy and who doesn't, if China does it, if Japan does it, if Europe does it, if Europe doesn't, then they have the control of the world. Um, they, also, uh, they also encircled their rivals with military interventions, uh, as in Afghanistan, and built some 800, a total of 800 military bases around the world. NATO, which was supposed to be the protection against the perceived Soviet threat during the Cold War, was supposed to go away. It should have been disbanded. There should have been a peace dividend, what, what they call the peace dividend. We never got the peace dividend, did we, Martin? Never. Instead, NATO has become the armed forces of the Western countries, of the U.S. empire predominantly. And the, on the economic side, globalization, all these international trade deals, have given the United States and the multinational corporations free sway in most of the countries of the world that, that allow them to do so. And so they have undermined the national sovereignty of many countries, it, and it allows the penetration of U.S. capital all around the world. So these were the interventions in those 25 years. Quick look, and Libya and uh, Sudan and Syria all happened in 2011. A different thing about the uh, the, the uh, unipolar world and the way that the United States has operated is that uh, instead of using their own troops much of the time now, they hire terrorist mercenaries to do to be their boots on the ground. And uh, it started really big in Afghanistan when the United States created the Taliban, created Al-Qaeda, in order to overthrow the uh, pro-Soviet uh, government in Afghanistan at that time. But they've used it many times since then. They used them in Serbia uh, over the fight over Kosovo. The Kosovo Liberation Army was merely a gang of drug smugglers and human traffickers that the United States with the help of Osama bin Laden, turned into a, uh, a military operation. Uh, and in fact, NATO bombed Serbia for 78 days as the air force of, the, of these thugs. And then and again in Syria, we've seen the ultimate of this. We've never, in history, we've never seen anything like this before, where uh, there are tens of thousands, nobody knows exactly how many terrorist mercenaries operating in Syria and in Iraq who are uh, uh, proxies of the West, paid for by uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and armed by the United States, trained by the British French, uh, probably the Canadian Special Forces, we were not told this, uh, and these people are, operate with uh, utter brutality and barbarism. Um, and we know them as al-Nusra, which just branded itself as, um, I think they call themselves Nusra al-Sham now, uh, which is the Al-Qaeda franchise. There's ISIS, which is also called Daesh. And then there are a whole bunch of other terrorist organizations that are operating in Syria as well. So how does the United States and the West get away with marketing this neo-colonial oppression in so many countries? And the answer is that, um, it's a, we have a new form. In the old days, 18th and 19th century colonialism, Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, they had uh, a philosophy of the white man's burden. They were going into all these countries of Africa, Asia, Latin America, and they were uh, basically missionaries. They were saving these poor, benighted savages from, and, uh, from uh, ignorance and barbarism, and they were bringing them uh, European civilization. You can see in this cartoon, uh, that um, John Bull, representing, the United, uh, representing the Britain at the time, uh, is carrying in a basket a Chinese, uh, a China, an, or an Asian person, um, an African person, an Arab person, a Turk, and one other, an Indian. And uh, they're, they're going over these stumbling blocks all the way up the hill until they finally get to the promised land, which is European civilization. So that's the white man's burden. And we have a new form of it today called humanitarian interventionism. And uh, humanitarian interventionism is where uh, 
nice countries in the West, such as the United States, Canada, Britain, France, uh, go into countries such as Libya, Iraq, uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, to help out the people. Uh, they're in Afghanistan, they were there to help women. In Iraq, it was to put down a terrible dictator and bring democracy. That was part of it. In uh, Libya, it was because the, the dictator there, in quotation marks, uh, Colonel Gaddafi, was supposedly using uh, African mercenaries and giving them Viagra to, to rape uh, the Libyan women. Turned out to be a complete lie, but it's a good pretext to, to uh, sell to the American people. And so humanitarian intervention is the general theme, but Canadians have this particular responsibility here because there's a new form of it called R2P, Responsibility to Protect, which was developed right here in Canada. It's a made in Canada product, and uh, you can, the building it was the created in is there in the picture. It's the Monk Center of International Global Studies at the University of Toronto. This, this uh, policy was developed, and it was taken by Prime Minister Paul Martin to the United Nations, I believe it was 2001, to the General Assembly. And um, at, uh, in 2005, at a World Summit, the uh, United Nations officially adopted, um, there are seats up here, I think. Um, let's see if you're, there's one seat here and one seat there. Feel free. Um, it was sold to the United Nations, adopted to the United Nations, and this is these are the these are the uh, key words uh, here. Uh, we are prepared to take collective action on a case by case basis and in cooperation with relevant regional authorities, uh, organizations as appropriate. Should peaceful means be inadequate and national authorities manifestly fail to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. So the very first time that this was used was in Libya, in 2011. And UN Resolution 1973 was authorized under the R2P to, uh, to cr create a no-fly zone in Libya, over Libya. And the Libyan government honored the no-fly zone. It did not send any planes up. But NATO did not honor the no-fly zone. It did not honor UN Resolution 1973. And they began bombing the hell out of Libya. Uh, they bombed it because they wanted uh, a regime change. And we don't know if 10,000 people were, were killed or 50,000, there's no reliable figures. But that, those bombs that you witness there, that, this picture, could have been by, from Canadian airplanes, because Canadian airplanes and Canadian ships participated in this illegal operation, in my opinion, illegal. Um, and it certainly was an abuse of UN Resolution 1973. And they brought about the downfall of the, uh, of the um, government of Libya, which is now a failed state. And you may have noticed last week that the United States again bombed Libya, this time because there are three militias who are fighting for power, and the United States supports one of them, and so the United States bombed the enemies of the militia that they support in that country. You may also remember that uh, Hillary Clinton made a famous statement after um, Muammar Gaddafi was a, a extra legally assassinated as in Sirte uh, in late 2011. She quipped, we came, we saw, he died. That was her explanation of her operation in Libya. So Bashar al-Assad came to power in the year 2000, uh, and many people in, uh, in Syria there was, uh, were excited because they, they thought here's a chance after many years of a uh, pretty um, authoritarian government of his father that uh, there would be a, a possibility of change. And in fact, Bashar al-Assad is identified with reform. And uh, the Americans came along, and they made him, they made him an offer. They said, um, Mr. Assad, we will see that you get back the, uh, the Golan Heights, which Israel stole from your country in 1967. And, uh, uh, but in exchange, you've got to do, make some changes to the policies of the Syrian government. 
you've got to break your alliance with the, the man on the right there, which is the, who was, uh, the president of Iran, which, with whom you've had a, an alliance for 20 years and had much help and support. Uh, you've got to break with the man on, the, on of Bashar's right, uh, Mr. Nasrallah, who's head of Hezbollah, and you've got to turn a, you've got to forget what, if you've got to just forget about him and let Israel do whatever it wants in Lebanon, invade again if they want. You've got to kick the Russians out of your um, the naval base, the only uh, warm water naval base they have in your country in Tartus. And you've got to uh, uh, kick all those Palestinian organizations that you give refuge to in Damascus. You've got to kick them out of the country and tell them that you are no longer supporting them. And that, to his credit, Bashar said no. He said, uh, no, we're staying with our allies, the Russians, the Iranians, the Palestinians. Um, and a few years later, in 2006, about 10 years ago in one month, the, uh, the Israelis invaded uh, Lebanon. And um, the, uh, their, according to the Israeli military, all their, their tanks, as they came into Lebanon, were met by a handful of um, um, Hezbollah fighters who were armed with missiles from Iran, and they turned those, those tanks into what the Israeli correspondents called flaming coffins. The invasion was over in, in days, but the uh, Israelis took revenge on Lebanon by carpet bombing the south of Lebanon. They killed thousands of people, destroyed thousands of, of homes and infrastructure. Um, but at the end of it, uh, a, a polling firm in uh, a Western polling firm took a poll all across the Arab world from Baghdad to Algeria, from Algiers, and they wanted to know who are the most popular people uh, in the Arab world, the most popular poli uh, Arab politicians. And the two politicians who were five, head and shoulders above everybody else in popularity in the Arab world were Bashar al-Assad and Mr. Nasrallah from, uh, from Lebanon. So in 2006, after that, um, after that war in Lebanon, after the invasion of Lebanon that failed, uh, and by the way, uh, at that time, at the time of the invasion of Lebanon, uh, President, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel was visiting his best friend in the world uh, here in Canada, uh, Stephen Harper, uh, and uh, this is where this is where. Uh, the Israelis look for the, the support that they get to, con uh, to conduct all the war crimes that they do. Canada was one of their staunchest allies, um, and still is, under the Trudeau government. So in 2006, the preparations against Syria for war, formal preparations, started to go ahead. And how do I know this? Uh, I know it from two sources. The top one is Seymour Hirsch. A Pulitzer Prize winning author and writer. Uh, he wrote an, an excellent article in 2007 for the New Yorker magazine called The Redirection. You can just Google it to get it. And it talks about the change in policy in U.S. foreign, in US foreign affairs at the State Department, um, that they were, going to, um, uh, they were going to redraw the boundaries in the Middle East. They were going to carve up the countries of the Middle East, such as Iraq, which they've already done. And they are going to, and they want to do Syria, and they want to do many other countries, and they are going to achieve this through sectarianism. They are going to turn Sunni against Shia, and all these, and you know, Christian against Muslim, and so on. They were going to use sectarianism as the means of driving a wedge in all these countries, uh, and creating, balkanizing all these countries, so that these these little countries would be a uh, constantly at war with each other because each each little statelet would be based on a religious affiliation or a, an ethnic affiliation, and the United States would be the power on top, pulling the strings and selling arms to all sides. That was the plan called the redirection. And the second source is below that is Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks. I didn't bring it with me today, but I have the book, the WikiLeaks papers. And one chapter is by a friend of mine uh, uh, from Just Foreign Policy. And he, uh, he, he shows the cables. He takes all the cables from the US Embassy from 2006 to 2011 
and he shows starting in 2006, the U.S. Embassy in uh, Damascus was tasked with the job of uh, regime change. So the war on Syria got going seriously in 2006. 2011 was the Arab Spring, and this was the moment that the United States was waiting for. I'm going to read to you a little passage from my pamphlet. Hello. Um, and the, uh, the pamphlet is from the grave, uh, uh, a, a page about the, the, the martyr, martyrdom of Father Franz Bern de Lille, a Dutch Jesuit who remained in Homs during its control by the foreign back mercenaries. Um, interestingly, he had noted in his journals that there was an armed and violent contingent in the protests in Homs right from the start of the crisis in 2011 and that the rebel forces committed many atrocities and then blamed them on the Syrian government. He ministered peacefully to his congregation, focusing on persons with disabilities, until on April 7, 2014, al-Nusra terrorists came into the garden of the Jesuit monastery and ordered him to leave Homs. When he refused to abandon his flock, they cowardly gunned him down in cold blood at the age of 76. His tomb in the form of a cross is laid in that very garden, Father Franz was the second foreign Jesuit martyr in Syria. So the point here is that right from the very start, these were not uh, uh, peaceful protesters who uh, uh, were in the mainly, predominantly in those event, events in uh, the so-called Arab Spring in Syria. There were violent elements right from the start who assassinated soldiers and, and, and police in order to provoke a reaction from the government. And that's how it got started. And uh, the Western countries thought that Syria would not last more than a few months, same, same as Tunisia and uh, Egypt. And here is an article in the Atlantic Monthly by Elliot Abrams, former security advisor to George W. Bush, and the title of the article is How Will Syria's Assad Fall? That article was five years ago. And the Syrian government has stubbornly hung on. Why? Well, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, in, just to make sure that the, that the uh, protests went ahead, U.S. Ambassador Robert Ford, uh, he is a war criminal in his own, he is a war criminal in his own right. Uh, he, is, he, uh, he created the death squads in Honduras. He, he repeated that again as a U.S. Uh, undersecretary or something or other in Iraq. And then he went, he was posted to Syria uh, in August of 2011, five years ago. He left the embassy and he went to uh, Hama and Aleppo to the demonstrations there to show that the U.S. supported uh, the so-called revolution, which was really the armed people that the United States and the Saudi Arabian government had organized. Um, and after that, he was expelled from Syria. When the Syrian government refused to fall, stubbornly refused to fall, uh, this, is a, this is where our former Prime Minister Stephen Harper stepped in. In December of 2011, he ordered the ambassador, a Kenyan ambassador in Tunisia, to organize a pre-conference for this founding conference of the Friends of Syria group in uh, Tunis in 2012. Um, and what, he, what the purpose of that conference was, was a division of labor and to get all the many countries of the world uh, in line to support uh, these terrorist mercenaries operating as proxy armies in Syria. And look who's sitting in the front row. It's none other than the queen of chaos herself, the wicked witch of the West, Hillary Clinton. And she's in there like a dirty shirt. Um, but Harper was in there too. And in 2013, the Canadian government organized the Economic Sanctions Workshop and hosted it here, in, close by here in Ottawa. And those economic sanctions that were leveled against Syria were so severe that it made life so miserable for so many Syrians that many of them were forced to leave the country and became refugees. Uh, there are three to four million Syrian refugees who are living outside of Syria. And there are about eight, seven, eight million more who are internally displaced people who have moved from the places that the so-called rebels have occupied, and they've come to government-held areas. So Damascus has double its normal population. Latakia has triple its normal population. 
Uh, just to make sure, the uh, U.S. Senator John McCain also went to Syria without permission of anybody. He just went. And he met with moderate Syrian rebels. Well, the moderate Syrian rebels that he happened to meet with, according to my sources, the guy in the back there ended up capturing and killing um, Shia uh, pilgrims who were going to a, a holy site in Syria. And the guy on the right and left of McCain, according to my sources, have become al-Nusra al and ISIS. So these are the nice, moderate Syrian rebels that John McCain got to meet and encourage in Syria, where he went without permission. Now, for five and a half long years, this war has gone on, and there have been many campaigns of deception, disinformation against Syria. You've heard about the gas, the gas attacks, the uh, massacre at Hama, I think it's called, or Dara. Many other things you've probably heard about. And this book here I highly recommend is by Professor Tim Anderson of Australia. And he goes through every single instance and he shows how it's a lie and how it's produced in the West. Um, I heartily recommend this, on book, this book, which is available online uh, for $9. I can't go into every one of these, but maybe Professor Kadri would like to answer questions on any of those. So how has Syria survived uh, when all these other countries have been destroyed or turned into failed states by U.S.-inspired military interventions? Well, one reason is uh, a, a positive result of the French Revolution in 1789, something we call today the secular state, the separation of, of, of church and state. In feudal times, there was a king and there was an official church. And if you didn't belong to the official church, you were never going to get anywhere in that, in that country under the king. But with the French Revolution, we had a new thing called a secular government. And in that secular government, the government's job is to guarantee the freedom of religion of everyone. And so today, most countries of the world are secular states. Syria is a secular state. Um, I can mention some countries that are not uh, secular states. Uh, two glaring examples. One is Saudi Arabia, where you can't even build a church. Um, and another one is uh, the Zionist state of Israel which is, they call themselves a Jewish state. And if you're not Jewish, and even if you're not the right kind of Jew, you can't get anywhere either. So Syria is not one of those. Syria is a secular state, like Canada. Um, so that's one reason, and, and it, you'll see from my photos that all the religious groups and all the ethnic groups in Syria look to the Syrian government for protection. They say, this is our government. It's a pluralist society, like Canada. Many minorities, many religions, and the, and the national government protects them. Here, these are some of the ethnic groups in Syria and some of the religious groups. And it has strong national institutions, uh, such as the army. The army is uh, actually mostly Sunni, but the army considers itself to be a part of the Syrian state. And this is a picture of the Syrian army. Uh, on June the 4th, they were entering Raqqa province. And uh, uh, the last time I heard, they were now 20 kilometers from the city itself. That's an important city because that's the headquarters of ISIS. <coughs> that's their, the headquarters of their so-called caliphate. They have powerful friends as well, Syria. Uh, this is the Russian and the Chinese ambassadors who are voting using their vetoes at the United Nations for perhaps the third or fourth time, I can't remember, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the vetoes were to protect um, Syria from, uh, from losing its seat, from uh, UN sanctions, and from, other th and from humanitarian corridors, from condemnation, etc., etc. The Russians and the Chinese learned their lesson in a very painful way in Libya. Uh, in Libya, they did not use their veto on UN Resolution 1973, and so NATO went ahead with its uh, abusing the no-fly zone, and they had regime change in Libya. And the Russians lost, a, and the Chinese lost a lot of money, and a lot of contracts, and a lot of they lost a good uh, an ally in um, Mr. Gaddafi. And they resolved since then that they weren't going to make the same mistake in Syria, and they have drawn a line a red line around Syria, in my personal opinion. They are not going to let Syria fall uh, because they know that if the terrorist mercenaries walk into Damascus, 
it'll only be a short time before they're into Beirut, into Baghdad, and then not long after that, at the gates of Moscow and Beijing. And the Russians intervened militarily and diplomatically in a very big way last September the 30th, 2015. These are Russian attack helicopters going after ISIS. They did more damage in three days against ISIS in Syria than the US-led coalition did in 18 months. They changed, it, they, it was a game changer for Syria. In Syria, they also have a reconciliation movement. If I have time, I'll talk about it. And the head of the reconciliation movement is Mother Agnes Mariam of Syria. Uh, we had her on a speaking tour in North America a little while ago. The idea is to have a peaceful resolution among Syrians rather than an armed struggle over the future of the country. And there is a minister for, uh, of reconciliation whom our tour met. They also have international solidarity from real leftists in the global south. So here is uh, President, the late President Hugo Chavez holding the Syrian flag. They also have organizations like ours in the peace movement called the Syria Solidarity Movement. And they also have a very credible leader who is strongly associated with national sovereignty and territorial integrity in Syria. And just to show you how popular he is, in June 2014, there were the first multi-party presidential elections in Syria in two generations. And uh, Bashar al-Assad, there was a 78% turnout. Bashar al-Assad, in a three-party race, got 87% of the vote. That's incredible compared to a Canadian election. Uh, Justin Trudeau got 39%. Uh, Stephen Harper got 39.2%. He got 87%. And that was an election that was monitored by a delegation from 30 countries. So what happened in 20, uh, 14 and 2015 was that we once again had a multipolar world. This is uh, President Putin of Russia after the uh, U.S. Cold, uh, coup in Ukraine. He welcomed Crimea back into the uh, so the Russian Federation. And that was the first time that the, anyone had stood up for the Americans in 25 years. So now this is our tour of peace. Uh, there's me. Canadian, two Americans, two Norwegians, one Jordanian, one Palestinian. For one week in, in Syria. And we were there uh, as a result of the fact that the Russian and, and Iranian uh, military and diplomatic offensives forced the Americans back to the bargaining table at, uh, in New York. And Resolution 2254 was passed. It's called the Roadmap. I think it's called the Roadmap to Peace in Syria. There were supposed to be talks in uh, Geneva, and there were talks in Geneva on April 15th this year uh, between the Syrian government, indirect talks, and the uh, so-called rebels. Um, and there was supposed to be a transitional government and, and uh, free elections after 18 months. Uh, but the Syrian government, as, it's, as my book is titled, is a defiant country defiant people, and uh, they had decided they weren't going to wait for a, a future time when there might be an agreement, and they have a new constitution, which the, it's a reform constitution, it allows multi-party elections, it was prom promulgated in 2012, they had their first elections of the government then, of uh, the parliament then, and they called for parliamentary elections in four years, so it was 2016, and they decided, well, we're a country, we're going to have an oil election, and that's what our, our delegation, our uh, second tour of peace to Syria, went to see. We went to see the parliamentary elections in Syria, which were opposed by the United States and all the Western countries. Only the Russian government finally approved of the elections, and the Iranians. So, the very first thing we did uh, when on that morning of the election is we were taken to visit the patriarch of the Greek Melkite Catholic Church that's patriarch Gregorius III. We went to visit him and uh, he welcomed us into his office and he told us that the elections were a challenge to the world. He said when other countries are meddling in the internal affairs of a sovereign country it's up to those people to stand together and what he did was 
<clears throat> to show how important the elections and the Syrian government was to him and his church, he led a procession from his office and his church through the streets of old Damascus, and he went to meet the Armenian uh, bishop, and together they went to the polling station with all their followers, and the, uh, Syri the patriarch put his ballot into the box, and as he did so, he said, Syria, one people, one country. That is an indication of how the minorities in Syria, especially Christians who are persecuted by these head choppers, feel about the Syrian government. They strongly support it. So, this is on the street the same morning after that little procession. On every corner, there were groups of uh, handsome young men and women um, with little flyers about this size, same as the one we handed out yesterday. And uh, it reminded me of union elections <clears throat> because what they had in their hand was a slate of candidates. There were 29 seats available in Damascus to vote to fill that day. And so on every corner, wearing their, their party's colors or supporting the you know, pictures of their candidate, people were handing out these flyers. Okay. I didn't realize the significance of it until later, uh, but as you can see, this was a hotly contested election. For 250 seats, there were 9,000 candidates. 9,000 when it started. By the time it ended, 6,000 had dropped off, there were 3,000 candidates, so it's only 12 per seat, right? I, so it was a hotly contested election. And there were a lot of women candidates. In fact, uh, 31 women got one seat, which is not that great, but it's, it gets better every time in Syria. And there were banners stretched across the narrow cobblestone streets of old Damascus. And then we visited ourselves five polling stations during the day in Damascus. And I'll tell you something, they're only two or three blocks apart, a lot closer than they are here in Canada. And then we got to see how the slate list worked their magic. So here is a voter who comes in with his ID card, and uh, the uh, people at the desk look at the ID card, they check it out. If there's no security violation, and in other words, if this person is not a with a record of him with the armed opposition. They duly take down his name. They give him a blank envelope and a, and a ballot. And on the ballot are 29 spaces, uh, which he, you can fill in one, or you can fill in up to 29 candidates. So the person can go in behind this, the, uh, the sheet there, and he can write in the names of 29 people, which is a lot of work. So what they do is uh, they take the that, that uh, little piece of paper, that slate list, and the, the, of their particular candidates, and they put it into the envelope and they can stuff it into the ballot box. Or, option two, if they don't like Jane Doe and John Smith on the slate list, they can cross off their names, put the envelope, put the, the, the list into the envelope, put it into the ballot box. Or, option three, they, can, they don't like Jane Doe and John Smith, they can cross off Jane Doe and John Smith and put Emily Brown and Mark Brown in those spaces, and then fold it up, put it in the envelope, put it in the, in the ballot box. So you can now see why it takes three or four days to count all the ballots in Syria. And so these were the parliament, the results of the election. Uh, nearly nine million eligible voters, over five million votes cast, it was so busy in Damascus that the polls had to stay open until 11. It was a 58% participation rate. Uh, in the one day, 140,000 refugees returned to vote from Lebanon because they were so interested in this election. And let me tell you, it's not easy to return from Lebanon uh, to Syria. It's difficult. It takes time and uh, effort. Um, and there were 250 members of the People's Assembly elected. 170 of them are from the National Progressive Front, which is the Ba'ath Party and its allied party. So this party has a, a constitutional advantage and 80 opposition members. And the American government dismissed this election as unrepresentative and held in wartime. Um, but the fact is that 
the Ameri in the American election, this is a wartime election in Syria, they get a 58% participation rate. In the States, they never even get 50% in the United States in the participation rate. And in Canada, if you want to compare it, um, in Canada, uh, we have, uh, we've only had two parties ever form a national government, liberals or conservatives. If you go through the House of Commons today, you will not find out of 318 members, a single member who supports Palestine openly. Uh, you will not find a single member who uh, is, a, is for the elimination of, uh, of uh, economic sanctions against Syria. You will not find one who's against capitalism. So I don't know how, uh, how much more democratic Canadian elections are than Syrian, and certainly the participation in Syria is far greater than in Canada. And there were some interesting candidates elected. This is Noor Arisian. I met her marching with the Patriarch that day. She came up to me and she knew I was from Canada and she said, thank you very much for taking 25,000 Syrian refugees. And then she said, but we want them all to come back very soon. She got elected. This is Noor al Shagri. Her brother Yahya was a Syrian soldier captured by ISIS in uh, Raqqa when they captured it. Uh, they ordered him <coughs> to say the uh, <coughs> caliphate will win. He refused. He said instead, the cal it will be erased. And they shot him point blank, killed him. And they videotaped it while they were doing it. You can watch it if you want to witness a war crime in action. So his sister won. She ran for the opposition. She won easily. The key point here is that there are no polls in the rebel-held areas. There are never any elections in the rebel-held areas. And that is because these Wahhabi-inspired terrorists, mercenary proxies of Saudi Arabia do not believe in elections. They consider democracy to be idolatry. Um, and they uh, know very well that if they held elections in their rebel-held areas, the people would vote for Bashar al-Assad. <coughs> So that's why there are no polls in the rebel-held areas. And as I mentioned before, those people in those areas have already voted, not with their hands, but with their feet, because they run away. And they don't run, people don't run into these rebel-held areas. They run away from the rebel-held areas. So they are literally voting with their feet. Uh, we met with the Minister of Reconciliation. I'm probably getting going on too long, so I'm going to Leave that to the question period if you want me to ask about that. But it's a major thing that has saved thousands of lives and has uh, there have been uh, at least 10,000 amnesties granted by uh, President Assad to Syrians, not foreigners, Syrians who are involved in these rebel forces to come back and become citizens of Syria or even to rejoin, the, even to join the Syrian army. These are some of the deals that they offer the Syrians, not the foreign fighters from 81 different countries. And then uh, uh, Mr. Haidar told us a lot about refugees that we don't hear about in Canada, and I could talk to about that a lot on the question period, and the many incentives they give for refugees to return. Uh, here is a very famous picture from Yarmouk refugee camp. This is a Palestinian refugee camp who was actually a suburb of Damascus, absolutely laid waste by the uh, terrorist mercenaries. It's not the Syrian government who turned these people into refugees. These people were refugees from their own homeland, Palestine. They were welcomed into Syria. They were given all the same rights as Syrian citizens, the most rights of any Syri Arab country, except the right to vote, because they didn't want to dilute their right under international law to return to Palestine. So I could talk about that on the end of question period. And finally, we got to go to Palmyra, which uh, was liberated about two weeks before we arrived in Syria. And this is a, what a column of ISIS sold, uh, troops look like. Uh, these, these, uh, three columns of these came across the desert in 2015 to capture Palmyra. One of them was, came all the way from uh, Iraq, 
One came from Raqqa, a distance of several hundred kilometers, and one came from the outskirts somewhere of Palms. And they crossed the desert in open convoys like this in broad daylight, and the U.S.-led coalition did not fire a single bullet or drop a single bomb on them. And you may ask, why is that? And I'll tell you, that is because, in my opinion, ISIS is a U.S. asset. It's part of the, the strategy outlined by Seymour Hersh in the redirection to use sectarianism to divide the people of the Middle East, in this case, to use fanatical um, uh, so-called Islamic, they're not really Islamic at all, mercenaries to break up the various countries. And so ISIS never gets bombed by the Americans when they're attacking the Syrian government, as they were in Palmyra that day. It's only when they're attacking the Kurdish state that the Americans have carved out of Iraq in the north. Then they get bombed by the Americans. So <laughs> they did not, 200 Syrian soldiers were martyred when these, these headshoppers showed up in Palmyra in 2015. And this is Palmyra, and they, which they uh, destroyed, well, parts of it. My, our cultural guide, Antoine, is standing in front of the ruins of the Temple of Gaul, which was destroyed by ISIS. This is a world heritage site. It's part of the common heritage of all of us, all humanity. And they destroyed that temple, another temple, and the Arch of Triumph. And this is in front of the museum in Palmyra. And uh, fortunately, the Syrian government had all the stuff, important stuff, small stuff, inside the museum secreted away somewhere else. But the big stuff that they couldn't move, uh, the uh, ISIS people took hammers to and they systematically smashed it into little pieces. Um, and, by the way, they, uh, they beheaded the curator of the museum, who was 82 years old, and stuck his head on one of the poles there, one of the, uh, of the gates of the fence there. These are the people paid by Saudi Arabia and armed by the United States. There was a lot of damage in the town of Tadmor, which is the new town belonging next to Palmyra. And we were there on the day that the Syrian government were, and the Russians were allowing the inhabitants of Tadmor to come into the town and go through the ruins of the city, of their homes, and bring out their pots and pans, their vacuum cleaners, their mattresses, their carpets, and put them on buses and trucks, and get them out of there because there was no water anymore or hydro. hydro. Um, and we spoke to uh, one family, this family in fact, there were, we spoke to the, the patriarch of that family, and we, as usual, were wrong about the Syrians. We always figured that they were going to be downcast, depressed, and pessimistic. And when we asked this, the, the patriarch of this family how he was doing, one of our people, spoke Arabic, asked him directly. We could talk to anybody we wanted to. Um, the, the, the patriarch said, um, now that the, the, the terrorists have been dri driven out of our town, everything is going to be fine. Everything will be fine. And he said, you, this destruction you see around you, no problem. We're going to rebuild the town of Podmore, and it will be twice as beautiful as before. And that, that is the resilient nature of the Syrian people whom we met and spoke to. And while we were there, the Russian sappers, were, you can see the columns of smoke at the lower level in the distance, they were still detonating mines and booby traps that had been set by ISIS. This is a very famous photo, and part of the, the victory celebrations and the liberation of, of Palmyra. And uh, the, Russian, but the, the Russian government flew in an entire symphony orchestra to play a concert called Praying for Palmyra for the soldiers who were, had been killed and the civilians who had been killed in the ISIS occupation. And um, um, I wanted them to mention that Bush, when he started the war on terror, of terror, at the beginning, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the slideshow, had said that this is a clash of civilizations that we have between West and East. And my feeling is it's not a clash of civilizations, it's a uh, clash between civilization and barbarism. And in my opinion, the Syrian people, the Syrian government, the Russian government, the Iranian government, uh, the, Le the Hezbollah are on the side of civilization. And the United States, Saudi Arabia, the Arab monarchies, and our Canadian government 
are on the side of the, barber, the barbarians. So, I would like to take a few minutes in conclusion to talk about Trudeau's mistaken foreign policy on Syria. You may remember that, uh, the, Canadian, that the Liberals and Conservatives opposed the Harper government on sending airplanes to the U.S.-led coalition. And when he came to power, uh, Trudeau announced uh, the day after he got power that he had spoken to Obama and he was pulling the planes out. And we were really happy in the Hamilton coalition to stop the war because, and we declared victory on our petition, which was to pull the planes out of the bombing of Syria. Because bombing Syria, when you're not given authorization by the government, is a war crime. And Canada was participating. But what happened instead was that Trudeau took out the war planes and he left in the reconnaissance planes, the tankers, and the and the refuelers. And so Canada is not directly involved in uh, US-led bombing of Syria. But uh, we are accomplices. It's like being the getaway driver in a bank robbery. You're not actually holding the gun to the teller's head, but you're driving the getaway car. So what else? The other part of Trudeau's mistake in foreign policy is that as you can see here, two Canadian soldiers in uh, northern Iraq, in the separatist Kurdish state that the U.S. has de facto created, they are wearing the flag of that state, the Kurdish flag of that state. These are your Canadian soldiers paid for by your Canadian taxpayer dollars. <clears throat> and um, what he did was he tripled the number of so-called trainers, Canadian trainers of the Kurdish forces in uh, Kurdish separate state in northern Iraq. So Canada is in fact participating in the dismemberment of Iraq, which is against our foreign policy. Our state of foreign policy is for the territorial integrity of Iraq and Syria. Here is our wish list as members of the peace movement for Justin Trudeau. I won't go through point by point, but you can see that what Canada should be doing is uh, ending the state of war we have with Syria and its economic sanctions, it should be normalizing relations, and uh, making a clean break from the Harper area era politics. We should terminate the Saudi arms sale if you came in late. We have a postcard about terminating the Saudi arms sale we'd like you to sign. And we should quit NATO. We should quit NATO because every, every because we're in NATO, we get dragged into every war of the US empire. So we should develop instead an independent Canadian foreign policy. Why? Because there's a danger of world war. A very great danger of world war in the Middle East. It's a powder keg like the powder keg that existed in the Balkans uh, 102 years ago in Europe. And we're dealing here with nuclear powers. Russia, China, United States, Britain, France, they all have nuclear weapons. There is a, it, the, the struggle, the war in uh, Syria could easily expand to a regional conflict and to a world conflict. So it's in our interest that we bring an end to it. And that's why I say that long live Syria, that we should help the Syrian state regain its territorial integrity and national sovereignty, and we should support the fight, their fight, it's our fight as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again for, uh, this was uh, enlightening uh, indeed, and it's kind of a uh, historic uh, lesson in addition to what's happening in, uh, in Syria today. I wanted to dwell um, a little bit on a few things um, rather than have a, a long talk uh, for you. Um, in 2011, I was speaking at the Kautschuk Conference in its 81st uh, session. This is a yearly conference that covers an area, and the topic was about the Arab Spring. And in one of the discussions that I had on the side uh, with a former Canadian ambassador to the United uh, Nations, he told me I could fiercely defend our position from a diplomatic perspective to have the resolution 1973 to bomb Libya. We had to free the Libyans from that dictator that is called Muammar Gaddafi. And that was at lunch. And later, after there was a session, one of the speakers was General Charles Bouchard, 
was the head of the NATO group that bombed Libya. And to my surprise, in front of everyone, he laid out in a presentation four pictures and he started looking at them by elimination that we could not collaborate with them. And one by one, he said, we could only collaborate with this person. His name was Abdel Hakim Bakhaj. Although we knew ahead of time that he's a member of Al-Qaeda and he's a leader within the Al-Qaeda movement. But he is the one who had the men on the ground to defeat Gaddafi. And the second stunning thing that he said, he said, we knew by the minute where Gaddafi was, but we did not have the political mandate to kill him or capture him. So from a diplomatic perspective, our diplomats are defending bombing Libya to liberate them from Gaddafi. But those people who are doing the actual work on the ground, NATO and the military group, they did not have the political mandate to kill him or capture him. And you look at the paradox in there, and that's where you start to see, okay, well, there is some conspiracy going on, on there. They did not want to kill Gaddafi, they wanted to destroy Libya. And by having those mercenaries work, Al-Qaeda, against Gaddafi, defeat each other, it's only then that they will be able to take control in Libya. And then, a few months later, I was speaking to a group of ambassadors in Ottawa, and that one was one of the things, we had a fresh visit from two ministers in Canada, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. John Baird, and the Minister of International Trade, Mr. Ed Fast, together with 11 CEOs, and they came back with a press release. And with Canada saying that, we are good and we have the expertise in construction, in mining, in information technology, in oil extraction, and we went there in order to see how we can rebuild in Libya. The damage in Libya was about $400 billion. But we, Canadians, Foreign Affairs Minister, International Trade Minister, with 11 CEOs going there, was no mention of building democratic institutions. There was no mention of helping edu in education, in healthcare, in anything. We were looking at Libya as a cash cow that we're going to go and try to get all that. Those lessons were learned in the hard way by Russia. The same Canadian ambassador to the United Nations is telling me the Russians are lying. They should not say that we kind of dragged them into war without spying. In the resolution 1973, we took it under Chapter 7. And under chapter, anything that we take under Chapter 7 is something that will allow us to use military force. And that's why we did it in, in Libya. Well, guess what? They were not fooled again in Syria. The Russians and the Chinese, they used their veto power three times in order to prevent that bombardment of, uh, of Syria. Backtracking a little bit, I'm somebody who comes back from, comes from the Arab world. I'm no fan of any dictator whatsoever. Yeah. Everybody in Syria saw that there was a military authoritarian regime under Hafez al-Assad. But when Bashar al-Assad came in, many people said, okay, well, we didn't like the way that things were orchestrated. But he was loved in Syria, just like we have here earlier Trudeau here, and Justin Trudeau comes as a new, young, fresh face, and people go and vote for him. And that's what Bashar al-Assad did. And he ended up becoming the president of Syria. But in 2010, just one year before what they call the resolution, the revolution, <coughs> Bashar al-Assad, together with his British-born wife, graduated in computer science from um, London College, he is a, a doctor, an ophthalmologist, graduating from the UK. They were the darling at Queen Elizabeth. They were received at Ten Downings. Uh, they were at the covers of the Time magazine. Those are the young leaders that are reforming the country. And they did lots of reforms. In Syria, there are lots of things that many people don't know about. 
I was speaking once on power and politics, and I stated some some sets of data. And I received an email from a, a dean of engineering from McMaster University telling me, "Thank you very much for saying all of this. I have to go research it. And we've never heard of it, and we are being misinformed by the Canadian media." In Syria, education is free. University education is free. So people graduate with degrees in pharmacy, in engineering, even medical schools, law, for free. They pay nothing. Okay? They pay an university fee worth $2, something like that per year. And that is something. That we've seen what happened in Montreal here. When the government, or they wanted to increase tuition fees a little bit. We've seen the chaos and the riots and people refuse that. This is free in Syria. In Syria, medical, uh, everything that has to do with medicine is free. Not only treatments at hospitals, but also drugs. So when you are prescribed a drug, you get that for, for free. It's not something that exists in any place in the world. We've seen President Obama fighting tooth and nail in order to introduce some insurance plans in, in the United States. This is this. 90% of the people in Syria, they own their houses mortgage-free. 90% of the people in Syria, they own their houses mortgage-free. In Canada, the rate is 60% of the people, they own their houses, and most of them, they're mortgaged. So you see what kind of government offers with the, they exist in there. I could list a lot of many, many other things that the Syrian government was given to, to their people. The unemployment rate in Syria in 2011 was about 7.5%, something commensurate with what we see in the Western world and many of the advanced countries. Subsidization of... Uh of wheat, sugar, That's uh, sort of diesel things. fuel. Uh... Those are lots of other things. There's subsidization of lots of other things. Nobody <coughs> lives on the street. Yeah. Uh, within the Arab world, Syria was second to Iraq, and now Iraq is at the bottom in terms of illiteracy. Mm -hmm. Iraq was the top in terms of literacy. They eliminated the literacy 100%. Syria did the same thing. Yeah. But now we are having a generation that they don't have schools to, to go to. So this was the government that everybody else wanted to overthrow. Obviously, the Syrians needed some uh, freedoms on the political side. But change takes time. And between 2000 and 2011, with the governance of uh, Bashar al-Assad, we have seen lots of reforms coming. And this is a country where 50% of the people are below 30 years of age. This is a young population that is growing, that is improving a lot. The government gave lots of subsidies to farmers. The government, they, they work on desertification of many other places. Uh, they <coughs> were working towards the environment, planting more than 3 million trees every year. So th there were lots of good reforms that we see in, um, in the Western world that we would hope that we get them. But of course, there were things that they could not bend, and those are the things that Ken spoke about in the, in the stages. There is the existence of the state of Israel in there, and that imperialist aspect that exists in uh, in the Middle East, where they wanted to uh, Syria to be isolated from all of this. They were at the front lines, they were given support uh, to resistance groups in Lebanon, to other resistance. They were in alliance with Russia, with many uh, other countries that the United States would not like. So those were the things, that, the factors that have helped the, uh, what they call in people in the Arab Spring to, to go. And of course, People in Syria know these things. They see them. When I went to Egypt, there were, in Cairo, some area that they told me that there's about three million people in there, in here. They live on the graveyards. 
The area is called al Makaber, which means the graveyards, and about 3 million people live in that area. The illiteracy rate was about 40%, people who don't read and write. Yeah. So you see when there are movements in there, and you bring money, and you bring act, other actors, those people who couldn't read or write, um, they were easily influenced by the uh, religious leaders in order to take action and be in that part of the region. This wouldn't be the case in Syria. And this is why the Doha debates out of Qatar, those democratic friends of Syria, you forgot to put democratic, <laughs> because when they declared those democratic friends of Syria, ahead of them was Qatar, that despotic regime who never had an institution in their life, never held an election in their life, Saudi Arabia, where women cannot drive, okay? they wouldn't allow elections in, in Saudi Arabia, and those were the democratic regimes that wanted to eliminate the dictatorship of, of Bashar al-Assad. Syria had a constitution, Syria had a parliament, Syria had political uh, parties. There were 49 degrees that were issued by the uh, prime minister of Syria and, uh, of course, the cabinet so that covered um, the existence or the, the, the allowance for uh, creation of new media outlets, new political parties. There are lots of reforms that were coming and they were in, in action. And of course, many people around the world, the Western world, did not like that because this was giving lots of power to Syria. Something that I never mentioned and I forgot to mention probably is that Syria and the government of Bashar al-Assad, they ran six balanced budgets between 2004 and 2010 and Syria has zero debt. Zero debt. No debt whatsoever. Canada, we had about $600 billion of debt. Stephen Harper added some of them, and Trudeau promised to add many more in the uh, next couple of years, about $150 billion of debt. Syria had zero debt. And Syria is not a country that was full of resources. Yeah? They had a little bit of petroleum that would cover its, its problem, its need. But they had a vibrant society that was productive on all fronts. Okay. And there is corruption, like in every other country, but corruption rates were controlled to the extent that the government was able to run balanced budgets and to have zero debt, internal or external debt. Given all that synopsis, we can say that uh, there were additional actors that came in. And if when I start to look backwards since 2011 until now and what has happened and what the Syrian people did, the Doha debates in 2011 at the beginning of the, of the war, and they said, okay, everybody was saying in two weeks Assad will be eliminated every two weeks, the next two weeks, and it's the next month, and it's been five years plus. Sarkozy is gone and Assad is still there. Uh, many others, uh, whether in the UK or in Spain, or they were changed, and Assad was still there. Not a big fan of Assad staying there whatsoever. It's up to the Syrian people to decide. Nobody else in the world had the right to eliminate the president of any country. We did not like Stephen Harper. We were stuck with him for 10 good years. Why? It's up to the people to decide on that. And I wouldn't give myself the right to eliminate Bashar al-Assad, it's up to the Syrian people, through democratic means, to do whatever they want to eliminate him or keep, uh, or keep Bashar al-Assad. But they wanted to do this, that there is a massive group of opposition against Bashar al-Assad. And the Doha debates in 2011, before ISIS came out, and before ISIS started the beheadings, and there was some opposition, and they manipulated the survey a little bit in order to get some numbers, and with that, 56% of the Syrian people supported the regime of Bashar al-Assad. And that was in 2011, and led by Qatar and the Doha debates. And they wanted to do the same exercise six months. Of course, they didn't want to publish that, but it was leaked. Yeah. They didn't want to publish the results, but, it, but they were leaked. They wanted to do the same exercise a year later, and the numbers went up to 72% because they've seen the horrible actions of, of ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and all the Islamic uh, Wahhabi fundamentalist 
uh, groups that were fighting in Syria. There are lots of actors that came from outside. The MI6 with the Britain and the, and the German uh, intelligence have documented 1187 different groups that are fighting in Syria. And each one of them has some sort of funding. Uh, you would know this is coming from Lebanon, and this is from Jordan, and this is from Tunisia, and this is from Saudi Arabia, and that's from Qatar, and this is from Germany, and, this, and every form of intelligence was working on the ground uh, in, in Syria. So, and then you've got 900 kilometers of borders with Turkey, they were left open. Yeah. And Saudi Arabia and Turkey were working hard. Turkey is an NATO member. They were working hard in order to support an idea. And sometimes you question yourself. You have the coalition airplanes, they're throwing support, and that's the military support from the airplanes on the ground to the Kurdish groups, and by mistake they happen to be thrown at ISIS. So that US military that tell you we are so strong, that we are uh, so strict and that we will be able to bump a, uh, a target to its base, they will throw 50 tons of military equipment by mistake to ISIS. And why was that happening? And it was turned out to be that Turkey gave them the coordinates, a member of NATO. And they did not want the Kurdish groups to win. They wanted to create a balance so that the Kurdish groups are going to be fought tooth and nail with, uh, with, uh, with ISIS and they will eliminate each other. So you see, there are lots of actors that, that exist in, uh, in that war in Syria. Five years later, Syria has become more defiant. The second largest city in Syria where it has six million inhabitants, Aleppo, is under siege now by the Syrian Arab army and uh, its liberation is so close uh, to, to happen. And this only happened when the coup d'etat happened in, in Turkey. Why was that? Because the Turks are dealing with their internal affairs. And yesterday, President Erdogan was visiting Russia and saying, OK, we were wrong on Syria. We're going to operate. We're going to have a new plan. Good. So we're hoping that the end of that war in Syria is uh, going to be uh, soon. The reconstruction of Syria is going to be um, happening on uh, a fast track. And of course, the people of Syria are going to be the winners at the end. Syria is going to be defiant. Uh, I would say uh, at the end, it's up to the people to decide their fate. And we cannot from far say, but um, got you the Syrians and look in Syria. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Yes, yes. Uh, do you have the number of causalities in Syria? Do you have any number? Because you, you talked about Palmyra and the destruction, but yeah. you did not talk about the number of deaths? Of course, uh, this is the, the most important thing. There's yeah. about uh, 480,000 people who have um, left us, they perished in, in Syria. They, that includes about uh, 67,000 members uh, of the Syrian Arab army. So that's a, a big group. The majority of the group are, uh, uh, are uh, civilians. Uh, those Civilians, of course, the media will try to change things the way that they want. Uh, but ISIS, in every place that they went to, Jabhat al-Nusra, in every place that they went to, they had to have the people either be submissive to their regime or leave if they were able to escape for their being killed. And they had those types of massacres on a daily basis in lots of countries, in lots of uh, villages and uh, towns, by beheadings or by uh, other forms of, uh, of execution. Uh, in no place where the government forces and the uh, government still have control, we had people that were killed 
or we had people that uh, were, were fleeing. It's only in those opposition areas that we consider the, uh, the, the civilians. And of course, within the war zone where their clashes were at. Yes? Yes, first, uh, thanks a lot for the two uh, conferences. It's very informative. Um, do you have up to date information on what happens like these days and the yes. last two days yes. in, in, uh, in Ramuse and, 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 and in this uh, well, around Aleppo? Yes, well, Aleppo has been under siege since uh, July 17th. Okay? And of course, uh, the opposition groups were not happy with, uh, with that, ISIS and with the support of Saudi Arabia, and uh, they have sent about 15,000 troops uh, in order to uh, break that siege on, uh, on Aleppo. Uh, when, when the government forces have a siege on a specific area, they try to enclose that siege and make sure that at the end they are going to liberate. They're going street by street because those uh, fighters have uh, dug underground places, they, they're operating in uh, like real military gangs that are advanced, they have advanced equipment on all fronts. So they are real armies that, that are fighting on, uh, on the ground. In the last few days, uh, there was a, uh, that siege was broken in a specific area, and that breakage of siege was a tactic. Yeah, so there was a discussion about it that, okay, we're they were starting to say that we broke that siege and we're going to retake Aleppo, but it was a tactic from the uh, Syrian Arab uh, army forces and, and their allies uh, to have all the uh, mercenaries go through that route and then the, uh, to be bombarded from, uh, from, uh, from here. And, uh, and I think that Aleppo is going to be liberated soon. Yes, please. Um, there is another group here, uh, the conference, yeah. Uh, the guy is uh, Gilbert Akhtar, yeah. and uh, the other one is a uh, guy from Israel there, Moshevsky. Yeah. Uh, who, who are financing this guy, and what is their, uh, their goal? And what, what uh, are the representative of the, what they call the so-called opposition? Or, uh, what? The, the biggest problem with what the, the people who call themselves opposition is that they don't have representation on the ground. The majority of the fighters in Syria that are fighting against the Syrian government are mercenaries that are from outside the country. They come from 82 different countries. And again, the sources are German intelligence and MI6, the British intelligence. They come from 82 different countries. And many of those are inspired by the Wahhabi jihadism uh, of the fundamentalist Islamic groups. So they have, uh, they are different faces of Al Qaeda, and they they are operating in uh, in Syria. Very rare are the Syrians who are fighting, and there are some Islamic fundamentalist groups also that uh, that are in there. But they're coming from Lebanon, from Tunisia, from, and we are we're seeing them going back. So what we've seen in France, unfortunately, and we're seeing in Germany, and those bombings that are rather happening, there are people inspired by the same groups. Uh, in Syria, the only difference that they have is that they're supported by, they were supported by Saudi Arabia, by Turkey. Uh, they had coverage uh, from many other uh, Western countries. So when we see a, a coalition happening, and uh, that's against international law, because the government of Syria sent a letter to the United Nations asking, telling them that you have no right to bombard in Syria any groups unless we ask you to do so. Because in one of the letters that was sent, the American airline, the American uh, uh, jet fighters, they bombarded six oil wells, operation, command and control operations for, for gas, natural resources. These are civilian sites. And even if the opposition controlled them, you have no right to bombard them. Okay? You cannot bombard bridges. You cannot bombard uh, these civilian sites because the government of Syria was trying to avoid uh, losing all that uh, resource base. It's going to take a long time in order to rebuild those six fields in the Daer Zur 
uh, governorate where uh, oil fields and their uh, command and control centers were, were bombarded by the, uh, by the Americans. They were uncovered when the Syrian government asked the Russian government to interfere. And when the Russian airlines started bombarding, in two days, they did damages to ISIS, what the American, British, and Canadian coalition could not do in six months. And when they went to Palmyra, can show that these were people who were traveling with their flags of ISIS 300 kilometers from al to Palmyra in the desert. So there is a desert there. You have a big fleet going in. You see them, and you wait and do nothing. <coughs> and that shows how uh, effective that coalition, or how willing that coalition is to, the, to defeat ISIS. They are the ones who created ISIS. Right. Yes. Like, uh, uh, the brother asked about Gilbert Ashkar was speaking this afternoon as part of this World Social Forum. Uh, Gilbert Ashkar is a professor at the uh, uh, University of London, England. And um, he is one of those people in the so-called left in the West who is used by the governments at, uh, to give cover for their military interventions around the world. Gilbert Ashkar, uh, during the war in Libya, was trying to make a Marxist excuse or Marxist rationale for why we people in the West should support NATO's bombing of Libya to get rid of Colonel Gaddafi. And he has never been made to account for this. He den today, he even denies that he even did this. So if you ask him that question today, if you go, uh, because his role was a very dirty role in Libya. He also supports the Western intervention in Syria. And he considers himself a leftist, a Marxist. And this, I think, shows a fundamental problem in the left in the West, that whenever there is a, uh, an intervention somewhere in the world by the United States and the neo-colonial powers, such as Britain, France, Canada, etc., there's always s some people uh, who are supposedly leftists who end up supporting this. And they write articles in the media. They get coverage. We can't get coverage. Martine and I, we don't get coverage in the in the mainstream media. At least not, we don't in Hamilton. You're I, peaceful. Huh? You're peaceful. Well, we don't support these interventions. But people like Gilbert Ashkar get interviewed on the BBC, and they make a, a, a case for how the West is doing the right thing by getting rid of this terrible dictator in this country, or this country, or this country, and they'll bring democracy and freedom to those people. That's his role. And who finances him? Well, I don't know. Maybe you should ask him that. Um, but it's certainly, they don't finance us. Thank you. Um, in the commonly disseminated narratives that we get in the media, there are, there are two main elements. One is that when the Arab Spring, so-called, began to appear in Syria, there were some modest demonstrations. There were some, um, there was an event in a mosque, and that the regime of Syria brutally clamped down upon this. We read about torture of children and so on. In other words, this escalated. So what has happened in Syria didn't have to happen. Because if Assad had been flexible, if he had really been democratic, there would have been room to head off the war. That, that's one thing. The other thing that we face today is that Syria cannot be put together. You know, it's. It's Humpty Dumpty, it's broken for good. Therefore, there is no longer any Syria. There is a, you know, you know, there are the Kurds, and there are this, and there are that, and Syria is gone. Uh, could you just 
tell us what you think about that those two that, elements? That Can I yeah. answer the first part? Perhaps you'd like to answer the second part. <clears throat> um, the picture on the uh, screen right now is from, I believe, 2011. Yes, it's from 2011. It's a pro-government demonstration in Damascus. Over one million people participated in this march. Um, and as you can see, there's a picture of Bashar al-Assad there on the, on the side of the building. Uh, the largest demonstrations that the so-called opposition was able to mount were 10 or 15,000 people. This was a million people, and there was one that's almost the same size in Aleppo, shortly around the same time. So it gives you an impression of where the balance of, of popularity or popular opinion was. It was for the government. The people of Syria did not want these foreign mercenaries to come in, and they witnessed for, firsthand the brutality you know, whenever they came in. The thing that, you know, it was not just beheadings, not just shooting people in the street. The thing that got me the most as a trade unionist and as a postal, former postal worker, was the fact that they would, they would kill even government employees. There is, if you want to see something really gruesome, go to Google, go to YouTube and put in uh, Syrian rebels videos, and you will see one where they, they took postal workers, I don't remember which city, and to the top of the post office, four stories high, and they pushed them off because but, they were working for the government. But what I'm asking about is, this was before the Muslim war. Yes. This was before there were any mercenaries. No, this no. is before the Saudis and the Qataris began to come up with the box and yes. send in. No. There was no foreign... What, I'm, what, I'm trying to, what I tried to show in my uh, presentation, which, by the way, before I forget, uh, is in the form of a pamphlet here, which I'll be signing and selling uh, after, whenever this is over at 3.30. Uh, and you can get this online at any major, it's cheaper even than online. It's about three bucks online at Amazon, Kobo, and iTunes. What I've tried to show what, uh, with the picture of uh, Father Franz is that from the very beginning, it was all orchestrated. The, the, the uh, Arab Spring was merely the moment that the Americans chose to overthrow the government. Right from the very start, they had their armed militants in these demonstrations, and they were shooting and killing police officers and, and soldiers, so as to create a reaction. It was a plan. No matter what uh, Bashar al-Assad might have done, no matter what he might have said, the plan was put into action. These guys were being invited in by certain elements in the country to, you know, the, including the Palestinian refugee camp of Yarmouk. And once they got in, there was no turning back. That's what we have today. Let's, let's not forget, uh, Syria is, is a country that is a secular society. The leader of that government, Bashar al-Assad, comes from the Alawite sect. The Alawite sect is a small sect in Syria. There are about 12% of the population. The majority of the Syrians are Sunnis, they're close to 70% of, of the population. Of course, um, some people say that they are in control, absolutely not, because the majority of the army is from the Sunni sect, but they are secular rather than part of those fundamentals. In the late 70s, 78, 79, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, who are inspired by the Wahhabi groups, they wanted to take over power, and they were planning for a coup d'etat. And they had to stop them a couple of times. In 1981, Hafez al-Assad bombarded them in Hama. And it was a, an elimination of that group. They uh, identified them as a, as a terrorist organization. Uh, and some uh, remnants of those, they left to Turkey some to Germany, they still operated from, uh, from outside. The early demonstrations that came against the regime, and no regime in the world would have 100% of its population in support. There, was, there were some demonstrations. The demonstration in Hama had about 20,000 people. The demonstrations in uh, the rural part of that day were smaller demonstrations. The biggest demonstration against the regime came in in Hamas, about 50,000 people, and they were all inspired by, by, by what was going on in uh, other places around the Arab world, Tunisia, 
Libya and, and, uh, and of course uh, Egypt and so on and so forth. Yet, this is the biggest square that exists in Damascus. A million people came to the Seba Island Square. So, that demonstration came as an answer to all the coverage in the media because you would have an area, and some engineers spoke about this, that would only host about 15,000 people, and they would talk about it in the media that where there was a demonstration in this city that is 100,000 people. They spoke about a demonstration in that Rastan area, it's a suburb of Hamas that had 100,000 people, and the population of Rastan is 80,000 people. So you had a demonstration in a, in a region that is larger than the population of that region. And you see how they could inflate all those uh, numbers in, uh, in, in the media in order to serve some purpose or another. They didn't cover those demonstrations uh, in Western those demonstrations were not covered in all the major Western media, thanks to social media. Social media made those public. Yeah. And uh, people spoke about them, but some people in Western media, they tried to, to bury those. Back to your question is that the demonstrations were peaceful. That's true, and that's absolutely right in the, in the first place, in the first couple of months. But there was the fifth column. It wasn't the government forces that were shooting on those demonstrations. <clears throat> there were all kinds of people who are interested in creating that chaos in Syria. And they started bombing and then arming the opposition. The first demonstration, there were clear instructions by the government of Syria that they would not ha shoot anybody in demonstrations. That was clear. And that command and control in the Syrian army is so strong. But once that happened in Syria, people in that opposition, they started to say, well, well the government is shooting at us. We better accept uh, and militarize ourselves, some of them. And then okay, we'll, get, we'll get you troops to support you. And those troops are going to come from Tunisia, from Lebanon, and from Morocco, and from um, Chechnya and from many other places around the world, from 82 different countries, to come and liberate the Syrian people. It's not up to some fundamentalist group in Chechnya, or in China, or in Lebanon, to come and liberate the Syrian people. If it were only part of the Syrian people, even if it is militarized, it will have more legitimacy than anything else. But it's having all those mercenaries, mercenaries from around the world. All Al-Qaeda members, they went and they fought in Afghanistan, they came back and they're fighting in Syria. They fight in Mali and they're fighting back in Syria. Abdul Hakim al Hajj, the guy that I spoke about to that the Canadian government cooperated with, who was Al Qaeda leader in Libya, as soon as the regime in Libya went down, he was arrested in Turkey because he was going with 400 troops from Libya to go and liberate his brothers in Syria. Yeah. So it's, it's that same conspiracy that is working together. Everybody would want to have a vibrant Syria, where the opposition would have a say, and probably they eliminate Bashar al-Assad by the ballot, not by the bullets. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Syrian myself, and I fully understand what's going on. I just think that uh, you guys need to explain to everybody here, so when they leave the room, they understand uh, what is going on exactly? Uh, you haven't addressed why this is happening. The big picture. We went into small details. This is excellent. Now we understand what's go going on on the ground. But why this is happening? Because no war happens for the sake of war. Yeah. Yeah. Every war happens for the sake of uh, achieving economic gains. It's the lust for imperialism, the lust for natural gas, for oil, supremacy. This, this is why the war is happening. I urge everyone to take uh, this, because there are going to be two more important discussions about Syria. There's one tomorrow that we're going to be talking about uh, Syria and international law. We're going to be covering all those strategic aspects uh, uh, in general. And there's going to be one on Friday about uh, Syria and Palestine and solidarity and, yes. and the actions that are important. So if, I, we urge that you look at this. If you want to expand your knowledge about this, 
Now we're going to be talking about it tomorrow. But absolutely, uh, it's uh, there was one. Uh, there's a good book written by Linda McQuaid in the 90s to talk about. Uh, uh, it's the crude dude. It's about oil. Yeah. That was uh, the war about uh, the war in Iraq. It was about oil. And now uh, we, if we want to look at the economic actions in that. There are two gas lines that are important for, for the Americans that they were looking at. One gas line is called the Napoco line, and they wanted to get the Russian, uh, they wanted to get the um, gas, and the gas, uh, to bypass the Russian gas to Europe. If Russia closes the tap, Europe is going to live freeze. 30% of the German natural gas, 30, 31% of the German oil ex, uh, imports, they come from Russia. Yeah. And after what we have seen now, the actors with Ukraine, there are lots of issues that are happening. The Americans have been thinking about this for a long time. They wanted to bypass that by having the Napoleon lines. And they, they work with many other actors from Germany. Yeah. So, the former chancellor of Germany sits on the board of Gazprom, who is in working hand in hand with the Russians to get Russian gas into, into, into Europe. And former foreign minister of Germany sits on the board of the Napoco lines that are in America. The Napoco lines were planned so that they would get the gas and bypass uh, the, the Russian gas, and they get it from Azerbaijan and many other. Um, places that have natural gas. Well, guess what? The Nepopo Lines plant was supposed to be finished in 2014. In 2014, they declared that it's going to be at least three years late, that project. And that's going to be in 2017. So the Germans could not wait for that. And they created uh, their own uh, gas company. It's called Gazprom, the same giant Russian gas company. It's called the called the Gazprom AG. It's the same uh, company because they said, okay, we're going to be reliant on Russian gas because the American gas is not. The Americans <coughs> wanted to secure another route of the Qatari gas going through Iraq and Syria, and if they could control Syria, they will be able to control that line to have the Qatari gas coming into the shores of Syria. That's number one. Number two, there are studies that the sea in Syria has one of the largest reserves in the world called natural, natural gas. So they wanted to also to control that. And of course, that's where the strategic elements came into play. China and Russia. China and Russia did not throw their veto in the Security Council to support Syria just because the Syrians are their cousins. They did that for mainly economic and strategic reasons. Even now, when uh, the Syrian uh, lira, the, uh, the, the pound in, in Syria, uh, went down, its the coverage, uh, its coverage from American dollars came from China. China put about twenty billion dollars in the uh, Syrian central bank, and so. Uh, 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 Iran and, and, and Russia in order to uh, protect the Syrian pound uh, a little bit. Those are economic factors that are very important. There is a fight for natural resources in that area, and uh, this is going to be there forever, especially that nature, the natural resources that exist in there, it's not going to cost much to be released to the market because it's on the shores of Syria and within the, the sea. So they could go directly into that. They could build pipes right away, or they could go directly on, uh, on the ships. Uh, and <coughs> it is clean natural gas compared to other the, to some of the other their gas. There's natural gas, of course, in the, in the United States, but it's happening mainly by fraction, mm. and it's costing a lot of dollars from Texas to transport them into, uh, into the shores. So. 
these types of controls uh, are important for anybody who wants to win from a strategic perspective. And this is why the Russians did, did not let this down. This is why the Chinese did not let this down. And that's why the Americans are going to fight uh, tooth and nail to the end in order to gain a foot in that, in that area. I don't understand is like as the mainstream media we hear that ISIS is so bad that they cannot let the US finance ISIS Saudi Arabia and all that. So why would they like, are they losing control or do you be like, really happy if uh, ISIS like, wins? I don't like, understand besides do they want ISIS to lose or to win? I it's not not clear in my head. If ISIS wins, they can defeat ISIS in a day. They would go and they bombard it. They are already the bad, and they would they would bombard them. They would invade. They wouldn't they wouldn't have a problem. But the fact that there is a legitimate government there that is fighting ISIS, they want to weaken that legitimate government, and they have been doing that for five years, and they've been doing As I told you, it's part of the figures. There's about sixty-seven thousand martyrs in the Syrian Arab Army. Those who were killed fighting ISIS and the like groups uh, in, in Syria. And when you look, how is ISIS funding itself? ISIS controlled some of the uh, oil fields. They were selling oil into Turkey. Turkey is a NATO member. If we are true about fighting ISIS, at least we wouldn't buy oil from, from ISIS. Okay? They were buying oil from ISIS. They were given. ISIS have, if you look at their fleets, they all have American weapons. America sells to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia gives those. And that's why there is that petition here. We don't want Canadian armored vehicles to go to Saudi Arabia. Because these are going to be used in similar acts. And you'll see in Yemen or you'll see them with ISIS and with other places. If I can just give an analogy. You know, uh, when you go to the dollar store, you have a job at the house, uh, and you need to use paint or do some repairs, you can buy a cheap hammer or a cheap uh, paintbrush. This is what ISIS is to the Americans. It's a, a, a disposable tool they can use to smash, like a hammer, or to cover up something like a paintbrush in a country that they want to, to intervene in. And later on, they can throw them away. And this is not new. Expendable. This is not new. Hillary Clinton said, we created Al-Qaeda. They created that in Afghanistan to fight Soviet Union. They're doing the same thing now. They're creating other factions of, like Al-Qaeda or byproducts of Al-Qaeda in order to uh, get to other goals. Who got the term proxy army on Google? And you know, the term. Yes, please. Um, One or two more questions. Excuse me if this is a really basic question. There are no basic questions. We're all here to learn, and we can. One thing I, I've been having a really hard time wrapping my head around is the goals of ISIS. And so basically anything that you can speak to. Yes, well, um, the goal of ISIS is to establish a worldwide Islamic state. And they call it the Caliphate. And they think that everybody in the world should be a Muslim, okay? whether they choose to do so or whether they are forced to do so. And what they wanted to do is that they want to establish an Islamic state. And they said, we're establishing an Islamic state in Afghanistan. We're establishing an Islamic state in, uh, in Mali. And establishing an Islamic state in Iraq. And then now it's in Iraq and Syria. And then we, there are talks in Lebanon that okay, there is an, uh, an emirate. This is kind of pledge allegiance to the Islamic State. So their ultimate goal is to establish an Islamic State where everybody is going to abide by, by the Sharia Allah. That, as simple as that. If I can answer, just yes. say something else. Um, countries have hard power, like military arms, planes, tanks, and, and soldiers. And they also have soft power. Soft power is things like you do like sporting events. Soft power is, for example, the Saudi Arabian government builds, uh, pays money to build mosques all around the world, including in my city of Hamilton. They pay for a mosque to be built. 
And when they pay for a mosque to be built in your town, they also make sure that the Saudi Arabian clerics are going to visit or are actually to be resident there. And they are going to promote their ideology of Wahhabism, which is, I, w I don't even call it Islam, because the, the great prophet Muhammad, may rest in peace, had great respect for Jews and for Christians. And the Wahhabi uh, regime of uh, Saudi Arabia and these ISIS people who are products of it have no respect for anybody else's religion. They don't even like other Muslims that don't share their faith. So I don't consider them even to be Muslims. But this is how uh, the Saudi Arabian government spreads its soft power through the world. Um, it, it also spreads its hard power by using it in jet planes to attack the defenseless people of Yemen with the with Israeli government and the U.S. government help. But the, these ISIS people are, product, are products of the soft power of Saudi Arabia. They're, 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 they're money to create schools and madrasas and mosques around the world from which they recruit these terrorist mercenaries. I hope that helps. Uh, by the way, before, I don't know if there are any more questions, later, but we have a, a flyer here about the uh, Syria Solidarity Movement, and there is a sign-up sheet, an email sign-up sheet somewhere in the room. I lost track of it. I don't know where it is. Okay, and you can sign up to be on the email list. Okay. Maybe one more question. One more question. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there room for opinions rather than just questions and yeah. discussions? Uh, I, I generally agree with your reading of, of what happens in Syria, the geopolitical uh, reading that you're doing, I fully agree with that. Um, my, my little disagreement is that on ISIS and its ideology, um, I think there is a depth in history of people thinking this way. Wahhabism, when you're saying they're not Islam, it's one reading of it. It's not the only. But it goes back to Abu Hanbal, it goes back to Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, and it goes back, there is a, 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 a historical route to Wahhabism which prevents me from saying they're not Muslims. They, there's one reading, and there is another reading which is more open and so on. And I think we should not underestimate the importance of the ideological uh, uh, grounding of ISIS and its, its use of religion. In my other life, I was supposed to be a clerk, Sheikh, but I ended up being a secular. And uh, I happened to, to learn a lot about uh, religion, yeah. And there are maybe four factions of religions. They, they, are, uh, they call them sects in religion under the Sunni Islam, and there is one under the Shia. Okay. And those are kind of acceptable uh, as moderate uh, Muslim. Slight differences among them, but these, these ones are, um, are key to the establishment of the Islam all around the world. But the idea of Wahhabism, you're absolutely right, it goes back to the Taymiyyah, it goes back, back to uh, uh, the establishment of... And these are different interpretations of Islam that say that we need to have a fundamentalist ideology in order to bring about Sharia law for the whole populace around the world. And Wahhabism, there was a sheikh, a cleric that's called Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, that started in Saudi Arabia, that has been inspired by those ideological fundamentalist teachings, and he established his own sect. And the majority of the uh, Muslims in Saudi Arabia, they followed that, at least when the government supported them, and that's how they were able to uh, propagate uh, that ideology into many places around the world, including the establishment of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Yeah. So thank you very much for being a great audience, and I uh, uh, would look forward to seeing you at uh, the other uh, conferences. There's that booklet that defines Syria, uh, with, uh, that uh, Ken is going to be signing.